recording. I'm recording. Cool. Well, Paige Weldon, thanks for doing the podcast. Thank you for having me. So I'm going to start in a way that I don't know if you're going to anticipate. I'm going to guess not. Okay. But what I want to do is I want to read you your submission email to the Comedy Bunker. Oh, God. Because it is the best submission letter ever to get on a show. And I feel that everyone will learn from this. This is okay. How to Get on a Show by Paige Walden. Okay. Hi there. I'm Paige, a comic in L.A., local. I wanted to submit to the Comedy Bunker sometime. Here's a recent tape. Credits and upcoming Wednesday avails. So you research the show to know it's on Wednesday. Here's a YouTube <laughs> link. Always send the YouTube link. Credits, The Late Show, James Corden, Comedy Central stand-up featuring Time Out LA comedians to watch, New York Comedy Festival, comics to watch, Paramount's Networks, Paramount Network's Heathers, the Comedy Central's Corporate. Great credits. And then you give the Wednesdays your free. Yeah. You and a thank do you it. for your consideration. <laughs> exclamation point. Always helps. Paige. <laughs> like, it seems Whoa. so basic, but it's like, I need, I want to put this on my website and just be like, hey, look at this first. <laughs> Feel free. Maybe some people will see it and book me based on how good I am at writing emails. <laughs> yeah. What's it's from a different lifetime. <laughs> yeah. What's interesting, though, is that, like, even though I know that's such a good email, I, I've never used that email. <laughs> I think it's because I live in fear of emailing somebody and, like, their show is no longer happening or I've just missed a basic fact about the show. Yeah. And so I, I research... You know, I don't, it's not that much extra work, but I try just to be aware of when the show is happening at the very least. So, <laughs> yeah, but it cuts out one important step because I don't have to go, OK, well, I don't have to look at my calendar and send you dates and then wait for your response. I already know which dates you can do. Yeah. <laughs> and it it is hard. Like sometimes you're booking a show and you're like you want to balance it between genders, diversity and then it just doesn't work out that way because people change cancel. They're not available on that day. So to have it all beforehand is so powerful. So that's the last <laughs> I'll say about that. But I just wanted to okay. say how great it was. <laughs> oh, man. Well, thank you. <laughs> and I'm also even though I submitted to a show yesterday, I realized I didn't take any of the advice I'm giving from your email. So I'm going to also do that now. <laughs> OK. Um, but looking you up, uh, what's interesting is the first thing that comes up is musician. Did you know that? Yes. And I, <laughs> I have contacted Google <laughs> to no avail. It just assumes I'm a musician, I guess, because I have albums. Uh, I'm not sure. That makes sense. Yeah. I think it just grabs it from, from the fact that I have albums on Spotify or something. And just the, the algorithm says I'm a musician. How did you contact Google? Well, I Googled how to change your Google results. <laughs> um, and they have like, you can suggest an edit, I think. This was a long time ago. And I, I tried a couple of times and it didn't work. So I gave up and thought, you know what? Eventually, someday, some thing that goes up online will help Google understand that I'm a comedian. Uh, but yeah, you just, I think you could suggest an edit. If you want to try suggesting an edit for me, feel free. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Maybe is, do you have a Wikipedia page? Maybe create one. I don't know. I don't have a Wikipedia page and I think you're not allowed to make your own Wikipedia page. Oh, it's like being verified. I've, I, well, you can ask to be verified on Twitter. You can't ask to be verified on Instagram. It's a subtle, difference uh, uh but um yeah i've tried i've tried you know half joking to add myself to the notable alum uh of my high school and i've uh, been swiftly uh <laughs> pulled down <laughs> that's cold as ice so who i know who can do it just like a rando who went to the school i guess so and you you i think anyone except me <laughs> But I think still they can ultimately decide that I'm not important enough to be listed. Right. 
But you could just make an email like Andrew Page and then, or I guess that's too obvious, but like something else and then they could, right? No? I guess I could. Yeah. I, another thing I gave up on. <laughs> right. It, it is funny that like the internet controls, like what the internet says about us controls us and we have no control over it. Yeah. <laughs> a minimal amount of control minimal, i guess i can yeah. choose what i post but yeah it's all it's gonna decide whether or not i'm uh, a notable enough alum alumnus of temecula valley high school right temecula temecula oh nice the <laughs> stopping point between la and san diego yes so true do you feel that now that LA is so remote and everything is remote, you could live there and still accomplish stuff? Or is it still better to be here in LA? Uh, better to be in LA. And my family doesn't live in Temecula anymore. So there just wouldn't, have, it would just be me deciding to move <laughs> right, <laughs> to a very conservative suburb in the Inland Empire. <laughs> it's interesting. It's like you, you left Temecula, your family's there, you're not there, but still be great to be on that high school <laughs> i would just you know i mean i lived there for 19 years i, I get was it there. yeah i'd like to be on mine <laughs> kitsilano high vancouver figure it we'll out we'll try to add each other after this oh there we go we'll get on the manipulation of the internet mm -hmm. <laughs> it does remind me of something from college marketing course where it was like your like they say companies brands is kind of like what the customers tell them it is and it's kind of like with us too on the internet. It's like your search is what they tell you it is. You can try to be this or represent yourself in this way, but at the end of the day, it's like it's out of your control. Yeah, ultimately I got to take the feedback and go, how can I put it out there that I'm I'm not a musician? I mean, maybe I should just switch. I should just Yeah, lean uh, into resume it. Resume the bass lessons I quit when I was 12 and and see what happens. Can you play guitar? <laughs> nope. I yeah. uh I I just I gave up and I, I regret it. It would be so cool to have an additional skill. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's what well, you have so many like cartoonist, actress, um, podcast, comic. I mean, how many slashes can you fit in a name? <laughs> you're right. You're right. It's enough. <laughs> yeah. How do you balance your day? Like, what does a day look like for you managing all these different careers? Um, I mean, these days it's... Uh, I really, I mean, I've done the Zoom comedy thing here and there, but it's really not been um, that frequent. You know, maybe once a month I end up hopping on a Zoom show. Uh, so most of the time I'm dedicating more to the podcasting and the cartooning. Um, so, you know, it's, I wish I could say it was a more consistent <laughs> day yeah. I could describe for you, but just kind of... You know, a lot of those things are once or twice a week, just trying to make sure I stay on top of it for like, I try to do a cartoon. My ideal is to have cartoons out every Monday or Tuesday, but sometimes it doesn't happen like that. Mm -hmm. um, I do the podcast, uh, my podcast mall talk with, uh, with my, such a good uh, idea. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We do that once a week for the regular episodes. And then, um, during the, the pandemic, we started doing, uh, Patreon as well. We thought, Hey, we've got the time now let's, let's dedicate a little time to doing Patreon. So that's twice a week, right? you know, and then the occasional self tape or zoom audition, uh, which is, is, you know, it's kind of nice to not have to drive to Santa Monica, but at the same time, I'd love to not be, uh, just, you know, sitting in my home after I close out of an audition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It is. So. It's like super lonely when you close the Zoom show and you're like, click. And you're like, yeah. Oh, <laughs> OK. And now to go uh, make dinner, which yeah. I used to not ever do. So let's see. <laughs> it's kind of like unplugging from the Matrix. You're like you're yeah. back out of your you're back to reality and whiplash for sure. Yeah. You're just like, OK. <laughs> I did a Zoom comedy show for a little bit. Um and it was surprisingly okay. Like I, I enjoyed doing it and it was, I got something out of it. It wasn't stand up, but it was fulfilling in a way. And I got to try some new material that I'm now developing outside of the zoom. So I know people shit on it and I probably shat on it too, but there is something there. 
yeah, I definitely have gotten something out of it. I feel like if I didn't have those to, to, I guess I'll say look forward to, I wouldn't yeah. probably have the motivation to write any material during this time. So exactly. it's been a, a good like benchmarker of like, okay, well I do have to, I can't be doing jokes that I wrote 11 months ago. You know, I need to be on top of this and ri- and writing about more, you know, more relevant things to me. Cause you know, it's like, it's the same as with, stand up before the pandemic if you're doing material that you don't really care about people can tell it's yeah. just gonna be and and it's much worse like you were saying like to close your laptop and just have you know bombed with material you don't care about <laughs> i'd much rather be trying to work on something you know totally it yeah. is interesting like i have those orphan jokes that like never came out but are still from before the pandemic and you're like, what do I do with these kids? Like, do I let them out? Do I raise them? Do I give them away? Like, I've been trying to like, I had a couple things that I was working on, you know, right when everything shut down that I've just tried to change kind of the context and the way I set it up. Like w- one of the jokes that, that I was working on before uh, was this joke about how terrible I am at packing for traveling. And so I've just turned it into a thing about how I don't miss travel because I'm bad at this, you know? Right. So it's just about, like, I've just like twisted how I present the premise a little bit, mm-hmm. but certain things are just, it's just like, you really have to do that kind of, it's sort of a band aid to be like, well, obviously I wrote this pre, like, you know, before, do you remember this type of experience? <laughs> and that, that feels strange. I am curious if, if, and when live stand up is happening again, if you'll have to still address like obviously this is from you know before or if everyone will be able to just like recalibrate back to understanding these premises i'm not sure yeah i think it depends kind of like where you're going to be in the lineup like (laughs) if you're earlier in the show there's probably a bit more addressing and as it moves on like you almost don't need to address it yeah like you're up and running yeah yeah if Mm -hmm. if you're like the last comic and you so COVID, you're like, oh God, shut up. Just we're here. <laughs> well, that's been my fear too with writing material during this time is it's like many people are having similar experiences and I'm trying to write what I think will be a unique premise or a, at least a unique take on a, a premise that probably a lot of people have, you know, but it's, it's especially hard when, you know, usually you're on shows every night and you can kind of see what people are doing. And, you know, I think probably... There will be a world where we realize that, you know, 10 of us have the exact same thing. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's like, yeah, you have these gems. You're like, oh, I can't wait to kill them with this. And then 10 yeah. people have already tweeted it two months ago. You're like, oh. yeah, man. <laughs> it's the most monoculture the world has ever been because we all universally have the same sort of experience with this COVID thing. So we're all thinking about the same stuff. It's so weird. Yes. Yeah, you have to try to figure out your specific like in this in this world where a lot of people are having these common experiences, what is your unique experience within that? And even that I'm sure is not unique, truly. Yeah. It goes back to the old adage of more of yourself and less jokes. Like the more of yourself right. you can put into this, the less you um the less likely it's gonna be someone else's perspective. Right. That's so great. Um What's one of the things that like you invested in in terms of your career where you're like you spent time to build and it like it really paid off and it doesn't need to be monetary. It can be like time or energy based. I think, yeah, it's an interesting idea. I think that um, I guess looking back, I, I was really good for a few years about going to open mics like every single night and really going hard. And then when I hit a certain point where that wasn't productive anymore, I felt glad that I had been doing that for a really long time, you know, because at a certain point you do hit a wall with it where it's like, you know, I've advanced a little bit past this. Not that I, I mean, I still would go to tons of open mics, but just not the way I did. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a period of time for a few years where every night, you know, I was making myself miserable at the flappers midnight open mic. And I do think (laughs) that that helped me ultimately. That was my first mic. 
<laughs> wow. Okay. How yeah. was that? <laughs> um, it was the bar mixing one, the mix, mm-hmm. mix, whatever they called it. It was, it was good. It made me, I actually did good enough to be like, okay, I have something. I can do this. Yeah. It's interesting. It feels like it, I, that was my experience with my first open mic too. I did well. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I don't look back and go, wow, it was because my material was incredible and I was so good. It's just, I got lucky that it was a good night, you know? And that propelled me. And I often wonder if it had gone differently, like how that would have affected if, if I kept going with it, you know? Yeah. (laughs) So. That is interesting. It's like, what are you, do you think back on it as like, cause some people are like, oh my God, I can't like when I, I was just, I just bombed for three years straight and you're like, okay. Which I did start to bomb. Like it was a a thing where I, my first mic was when they did an open mic at Meltdown Comics. Okay. And early on, everyone was so excited that they had started an open mic there because it was, they had their Wednesday show and then they started doing the open mic on Sundays. And I think it was like a lot of people who are fans of the show started coming and trying stand up. And so everyone was so amped and Mm -hmm. I would do that every single week. And then when I started to add going to other mics is when I was like, oh, okay, this is more what it's going to be. Yeah. (laughs) And so, you know, it's, it's also a balance of figuring out like how many nights a week do I dedicate to going to something that is truly horrible (laughs) and how often do I try to at least give myself a little boost so I can, and feel good about myself. Right. Uh, yeah that's interesting because the meltdown mic was one of my biggest mech, like mic bombs <laughs> <laughs> well it became very insular where like there were all the people who started there you know and so they all knew each other and they were all like coming every week and then it also i think kind of fell off when it started changing dates and times and hosts you know nothing nothing gold can stay <laughs> yeah um andrew steven has this podcast um about the history of stand up. He's like a podcast producer and the episodes on the meltdown were really interesting to like fill in my knowledge gaps about it and like Kumail's role and the production of it and how it, yeah, like the dates change and it was very dependent on the host and like it was a lot more to it than I had known about. It's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was kind of just where I, where I started going. It was near where I was living at the time and I just got into it. Yeah. That's great. What's one of the things that uh, you spent time on and invested in that didn't work out? You're like, I, I tried to build this thing and it just it wasn't for me for whatever reason. Interesting. Uh, well, I will say, I won't say that it was, I didn't get anything out of it, but there was a period of time where myself and this other comic, Robin Higgins, we had a online humor magazine that where we had comedians submit like written pieces and uh asking we comedians always, for more writing <laughs> yeah well it was like we started it during a time where we had all these friends who had the free time and were excited to do something even mm-hmm. though we couldn't pay them it was like we were also new right and then you hit a point where everyone starts getting busier and you know you it completely fairly don't have time to write stuff like that including robin and i didn't really and um it also i think it never really got big in a way where we could like sell ads and start paying people. So it kind of was already, you know, fizzling in that way. And then somebody, somebody hacked the website and destroyed it and we lost all of it. So that was a lot of time and energy for something that just, there's no record of now. (laughs) That's horrible. Did you say bad stuff about North Korea? Like what happened? (laughs) This is years ago. I honestly think it was just that it was um, this WordPress website that Robin taught herself to build. And Mm. it just it was before Squarespace and all those things that would just build a website for you. And it was just somebody. Yeah, me too. I use it. Sponsor the pod. (laughs) And so I think that, yeah, somebody is somebody who just didn't even know know what it was or care about it. It It's just somebody did it. Yeah. Squarespace is so good that like because I went to your website and my website's on Squarespace. It makes me like other websites better because I'm like, I feel familiar. I'm like, okay, I know yeah. what this is. This is this. And it's like, I recognize this layout. This is right. good. It's, it's, <laughs> it's number four or whatever. But like, yeah, it just, it because so many websites can be, uh, oh, cops, um, kind of engineered w- weird, like with the buttons in the wrong place and the links don't work. It's nice just to be like, cool, right. unique interface or um, simple interface. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And 
I'm very interested. I worked on this cartoon show, The Boondocks, like about 10 years ago. And so I love that space. Do you feel that your um, cartoon strip could be turned into a cartoon show? I would love that. Yeah. I, um, I never quite know what that would be. You know, it's something I'm always thinking about. Um, it is such a weird thing now where I can write on that and I can have that idea ready, but Right now, I'm really just trying to build a following uh, with the cartoons because, you know, I have an okay following, but not something that really makes someone go like, okay, this this following is going to follow her to a, a uh, right. animated version of this. So yeah. I'm just trying to focus on that right now. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. I, I would, it would be very cool to do an animated version of it. It is weird, the responsibility we all have. It's like, go build your own audience and then talk to me. Go yeah. <laughs> like, and it's, it, that's a whole nother skill to learn. Yes, it really is. And I, I feel like I also, I, I'll, I'll sort of, you know, I'll do things that I know I'm like, this is not like, for example, a lot of the cartoons I do on Instagram, I put them as like separate panels that you can swipe through. And I know I that people, that. Sh uh, cool, thanks. Yeah. I, but I, I feel like I always go, oh, I need to do the thing that I've seen people do where they do a, a last slide where it's all the panels together so people will share it. Ah. And I just always go, eh, next time. And yet I notice every time I do one that's like a single panel or something that's super shareable, it always does better. But I just, you know, it's that artist thing of like, oh, what I, I'm going to simultaneously like play into this thing, but also not play into it. Cause I'm, I, I'm annoyed or whatever, you know, <laughs> I a hundred percent get it. Like with the podcast, I like, I'll edit it, put it up like uh, everything on all the platforms. And then when it comes time to just taking a little section and making like a clip of it for mm -hmm. YouTube, that is like, it doesn't take long, but it's like the most annoying part. I don't know why. It's like that last step. I just can't do it. There's something about it. There's a mental block. I'm the same way with our podcast. We don't do video and we never have. And I always know that people like, I know people like to watch and listen to podcasts on YouTube. And I just like, my brain can't get me there. <laughs> yeah. I started in audio only and then I moved to video. Um, the, YouTube is just such a powerful platform for the podcast. And even though I put the audio episodes up on YouTube, it just didn't do the same. Yeah. I mean, people like faces, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. Yeah. Even I was listening to Fahim Anwar and Rogan, and he was saying, like, he's like, oh, I, I listen to you song Rogan. Like, I listen to you on my TV on YouTube. And I was like, oh. Yeah. I was like, I, I, That's a whole new way. I didn't even think about that. I've also had podcasts that I, I know have video where I listen to it and then I go, oh, I kind of want to watch that part. I kind of want to see how the actual interaction was, you know, and I'll find the video, yeah. even though that's not my typical way of listening, but I will find myself doing that sometimes. And I go, oh, maybe this is yeah something to listen to, <laughs> to recognize. <laughs> right. Because the less like produced podcast where it's more of a conversation, like there's a lot of nuance that can be missed. Like the ones that yeah. are very audio produced, like with segments and stuff, it's designed to be digestible like that. But the ones that there's like little nuances or facial expressions, like, uh, you know, like watching Elon Musk, you have to smoke a joint. Like that's like, like that's a video moment. You couldn't have captured that via audio. <laughs> right. So funny. Um, and then how did you transition from doing comedy to actor or did you act first and then move into comedy? I was just doing stand up at first. Um, and then I, how did I start acting? I mean, I started the first like big thing I got was Heather's. Um, and that was a friend who was in it recommended me. I still had to audition. I think he probably recommended a few people. Um, but that was like the first acting thing I did. And then I also had a commercial agent from fairly early on. And so I did a few commercials and, um, I, I always was like, yeah, I'm, I, I would, I'm open to all of that. You know, I never thought of myself as an actor mm -hmm. until people started. I mean, it's just the LA thing, right? It's like, you know, it's like you, you're here. Yeah. And so people 
see you do stand up and they go, they, I mean, it's probably part of why I do so many things, right? As in LA, everyone wants you to kind of do everything. You yeah. Know? Not a lot of just pure straight stand ups in LA. Yeah. That's you know? New York. Yeah. So that's kind of, it just kind of happened. And I haven't done a ton, you know, but I've done enough here and there and, and mostly commercials. Yeah. It is interesting, like people you meet and they nudge you just a little bit this direction. They're like, but what about this? Yeah. A lot of yeah. LA is, what about this? Have you thought about that? <laughs> yeah. It's like an old Mitch Hedberg joke about that. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was a joke that's basically just the conversation we're having. Oh, uh, I'll have to look it up. <laughs> uh, but yeah. And, and I mean, also, like, it's hard to make a lot of money doing stand up in LA. And, once you have acted enough to join SAG and you start getting residuals and stuff, it's just a much better, it's a really, it's a much better way to build a savings so that you're not constantly worried and that you can kind of dedicate the time to doing more stand up and it's all, it all works together, you know? Yeah. It's like a self-reinforcing cycle. You get healthcare here in yep. the union. Oh man. The years where I've made enough to get healthcare, I feel so cool. <laughs> yeah, it is amazing that these unions have like such good benefits yeah yeah like some of the best benefits in the world are like the director's guild that sag and so and so i forth. mean this the insurance i've had through through sag is the only insurance i've ever had that covers therapy or any of that kind of stuff uh it's it's pretty decent insurance although and i don't know the details of it but they definitely have come under fire a little bit for their changing the limits of how much you have to make right. per year in a time where nobody's making any money oh uh, yeah uh, so I saw, I saw that yeah yeah that's unfortunate <laughs> yeah it, it, it's like no matter what it is in our life there's always like a business behind it like there's a yeah. business behind healthcare and doctors and it it's it, it's so weird like that they have to run a business to take care of our health. Like I get it, but it's, it's still like, there's such a fundamental issue with it. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, it, it is, it is just like, it's, yeah, it's created this thing where it's like, okay, you guys are making less money because we're making less money. And now you're punishing us for that. It's just a really, it sucks. And I definitely will lose my health insurance in, in the summer. So, yeah. <laughs> well, no, unless I, unless I work. Yeah. Book something. Hire me for your commercial. <laughs> yeah. Did you uh, go for, uh, at some point take an acting class? I took one acting class like very early on when I first got an agent, they were like, you should take one. And I did. And I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to say I didn't get anything out of it. Uh, but I think what I learned is that if you're going to take an acting class, you should take a more like a more focused one. Like I took kind of like a general act, like acting early, like one oh one, whatever. And I wish I had taken, for example, I know that they have specific classes that are for commercial auditions, oh. you know, and I wish I had done that, uh, just because, you know, I think that, I'm personally more interested in one that helps me in the practicality of it. And then, you know, especially since most of what I do is commercial auditions, I, I'm not like that high end, like, you know, super, I'm not trying to be like an incredible actor, you know? Uh, so I rather just learn like, here's the basics of this specific thing. Yeah. I, I took a general one too. And I totally get that. Like I have a commercial agent, but we learn nothing for commercials yeah. and, some of the things I thought we would learn, I thought we'd learn like more voice stuff, more pre like it was very much script focused, which I, mm -hmm. I, I was like, okay, it was good to dive into that and figure that out. And like for them to teach you the nuances of how to deco deconstruct a script. But I felt like I, there was so much I didn't learn. And maybe that's why they want you to take classes for the rest of the time, basically. Yeah. I mean, they, they're just, they're not going to teach you everything because they want you to keep signing up for their classes. Yeah. And there is obviously value in getting those fundamentals, you know? I yeah. also did take an acting class in college, but it was just like my last semester or an easy class. And it was like a lot of improv exercises and yeah. stuff like that. I took one of those in college too. It was like, you need three more credits. So like, can yep. I do uh, improv? They're like, yep. I was like, okay. I took it and like, I wasn't focused, didn't care. 
Yeah. And uh, didn't respect it. But um, <laughs> <laughs> it was <Yep>. fine. <laughs> yeah. I, I found in the acting class, like, I would find little... I, I would get bored and I would find little ways in the script to like make people laugh and it, they're like don't do that yeah <laughs> they, they would get upset and i'm like this is all i have here well that's the other thing too is right when you take a more general class there's people in it who have all different intentions for how yeah. they want to use what they're going to learn and you know being the person who's going to use it for comedy or for comedic acting you again you maybe want something more focused so that yeah. you're not you know we're, you're not in a scene with somebody who's very, very serious. Yeah. There's this moment, I think it was in Comedians in Cars, when the, uh, Alec Baldwin's talking to Jerry, and he's like, did you ever think about acting? And he's like, when I was acting, he's like, I look at people, and I'd be like, look at him, he's acting. And he's like, like <laughs> I can't, like, and that's, I was like, that totally described it to me. I'm like watching, I'm like, look at this person go. He's, or he yeah. or she, they're, they're really doing it. They're giving it, they're... <laughs> I'm like, I just, I was just so amazed. <laughs> yeah. That's so funny. Yeah. I definitely, it is hard to really like immerse yourself. <laughs> Even when I watch, I was watching a movie earlier today, this morning, just with breakfast and not, I don't know why I said that, but I'm watching it. <laughs> I could have been watching any time, but I'm like, wow, I'm watching the lines. I'm like, they're just delivering it so well. And they're really selling it. And their mouth is moving. I'm like, <laughs> I, I don't have that much energy to like, like I, I don't know. I also do feel like the more acting I've done, the more I don't want to say it ruins TV and movies for me, but I uh, feel like I'm extra aware when I'm watching people make choices. Or yeah. I feel like sometimes I'll watch, I watch a lot of old episodes of Gilmore Girls. That's my like comfort watch, and I feel like I'll you know on the sixth time I've watched through season five, I'll be like, oh, I see that that character kind of tripped up on that line, but they just kept it you know it's kind of funny to be like oh i see that that actor forgot that line for a second or i see that they very intentionally yep. reacted in this way and i i sometimes go i wish i could just watch it like a normal person <laughs> you never will be able to again yeah. and once you do video for your pod and you start editing the video you'll have the editor perspective and it's yeah. all and now it's just it's all over that you're looking at yeah. the acting the editing the lighting i'm like why is it green this is green light. you're like i can't there's no magic yeah but when you watch something that's so great now it takes like that level for me to get lost in a show or, or a movie now like it has to be i just got into the crown i can't stop it's so good oh, i don't really? even I care about it. like the royal family or anything I somehow <laughs> pressed play and it's so good. Oh man, I got to check it out. Yeah. I, that's me. I'm the person who's, you know, something's been on for years and I'm like, oh, cool. I should check that out. Yeah. <laughs> At the risk of torpedoing the podcast, I've never watched Game of Thrones. I've never watched uh, Breaking Bad. Like, it's like sometimes the more people like it, the less I want to start. I'm like, I, this is. Oh, for sure. <laughs> I watched Game of Thrones. I watched Breaking Bad when it was on. I've never revisited it. And then I watched Game of Thrones. And the funny thing is, okay, because those seasons would come out like years apart. And one season, I forgot that I didn't watch a season. And the new season was out. And I was like, okay, I'll, tu I'll tune in. <laughs> and I was like, I know that this show is hard to follow, but I think I... I think I missed something and I like looked it up and I was like, yep, I fully didn't watch season four or whatever. That's so hilarious. I guess I'm out on this show. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 dragons and stuff. I just never really, never really yeah. got into it. I, I, I read the Hobbit. I think I read the Hobbit. I didn't read the other ones growing up. I, uh, did not. I kind of enjoyed yeah. the movies as like a spectacle, but like, I yeah. just, I'm not like, I don't know like the backstory. I enjoyed those movies in the same way that like, it's like everyone just saw those cause they were the big movies. Yeah. It wasn't like, I was like, Oh, I'm so excited about this particular genre. You yeah, know? exactly. Or like this, the, I wasn't excited about the adaptation. Like, right. yeah, like I've been waiting for this because I, I know the characters. I didn't know anyone other than I think the Bilbo, I think everyone knows Bilbo, but yeah, just some cursory awareness. Yeah, exactly. A little yeah. bit. There's probably some guy's going to be too short. Some guy's going to be too tall. There's going to be some <laughs> bow and arrows yeah. and uh, a bunch of people will die with CGI. So <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Sounds like popcorn night. <laughs>
Can I ask you one more detailed question about the cartooning? Sure. So when you're doing the cartooning, are you using like, is it on the computer with like a stylist? Are you doing it with uh, like analog, like crayons and stuff? Or how are you, um, how are you putting it together? So I used to, you know, I was talking about that website I used to, to run, the humor magazine. I used to do cartoons on like a, a drawing tablet and do it on the computer. But I just never really liked doing that. I think that I would maybe like it more if I actually had one of those drawing tablets where you're drawing directly onto what you're drawing. Ah, uh, like on the screen. But, yeah, but I had one that where you're drawing on a thing and then you yeah. look at the screen. The and Wacom. Just, yes yeah. exactly yeah. and i never i was like i can do this but i don't love it and i also don't love the way it looks in my style and so um i i also like kind of fell off of doing the cartooning for a couple of years because of the website going down and then uh last year i was like i'm gonna start doing it again but i really want to do hand drawn and so i've i've been doing them hand drawn and i watercolor them and i scan them which is a little bit of an imperfect science with, you know, scanning and uploading. You know, sometimes it can be frustrating because I don't have like an incredible scanner and it just, you know, I'll need the light to be just right or I'll, I'll scan two panels and they'll look different and, you know, that kind of frustration. But I think it's, I like having a sort of different style because I think a lot of people do just on the computer now. Yeah. And I think that it gives me a little bit of a distinct look to my cartoons. It definitely does. They look beautiful. And that, yeah, that, that's what it is. The watercolor. Cause like that's uh there's an analog element to it that really pops. Yeah. I think that like, I just, I just, it's just a personal preference. I like how it looks better. I like doing it more. And so it's just kind of what I ended up doing this, this time around. Oh, that's awesome. And then uh, I wanted to ask you one thing about your podcast. Uh, are you, were you like a mall kid in California? Like what, what was the attraction to like starting a podcast based around the stores in the mall with guests? Yeah. Um, so I grew up in Southern California and, and, uh, I, you know, like I was saying suburban town. So a lot of time, especially early on, like late middle school, early high school, a lot of time at the mall. We had just gotten a mall. It was huge. And, <laughs> uh, cause before, before we got the mall in Temecula, me and my mom would drive out to Ontario Mills, uh, which is a little bit of a distance, but you know, we'd make a day of it. It was always like a thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, then living in LA, there's so many malls too. And also, you know, I'm, I'm someone who like when I'm on the road, if I have a time to kill, I find the local mall and I, yeah. I walk around and I really enjoy it. I find it like, it's just like a comforting place to just kind of mosey around and just loiter and just kind of maybe buy something, you know? And, um, so I, I really, I would also spend a lot of time, like, I miss it. I used to like go to the Americana and sit at the Barnes and Noble and write. That was oh, like nice. something I really enjoyed doing. And then my friend Emily, who I host the podcast with, is the same way. She grew up in L.A. Yeah. And so uh, she she also spent a lot of time at malls and still likes going to the mall. And we were talking about it and we just came up with this idea. And it's been cool doing the podcast because you realize, like, even if people didn't hang out at the mall a ton as, as teenagers, which a lot of people did, so there's plenty to talk about, it just kind of ends up becoming sort of an interesting thing to talk about with someone like these sort of touchstone moments growing up and, you know, these weird interactions with consumerism and how you went through fate. Maybe you went through a goth phase or maybe you yeah, were afraid yeah, of yeah. hot topic or, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, and I, it's, uh, it's just become really fun to talk to people about. So, yeah. And it intertwines with like our movie culture and our pop culture and in a way that, was this like so formative like every teen movie there was like a mall scene where yes. like something happened there's like it's almost like little kid gangs in the mall that for some reason the yeah, adults could never control yeah i mean like it's an easy place to drop off your kid yeah and and just leave them for a few few hours maybe with a few bucks so they can buy panda express or whatever right um we'll yeah see, we'll see if the next generation even knows what a mall is I feel like they do. I don't know. I think that um, in my experience, when you go to a mall now, you still see those groups of you teens. You do, yeah. You totally still see it. I think that, I think obviously, you know, malls are dying. There's a lot less. They're not successful in the way that they once were because people online shop. But I think that kids totally still hang out at the mall. 
Yeah, the kids don't care if the businesses are failing. We want to go to the no. food court and like watch them fail. <laughs> yes, for sure. And I, I think, yeah, I think that they totally still do. And I and I love in movies whenever there's like a good mall scene. I loved in eighth grade when when they were at the mall. Uh, I don't know if you saw that, but I think that. And that's something we started doing on, on the Patreon is we'll watch like mall movies or movies oh, nice. that have a really good mall scene or something like that. Do you like break them down with commentary? We haven't done the whole thing where you like listen simultaneously. We just watch them and talk about them. Oh, okay, nice. Yeah. Do you have a favorite? Is it the eighth grade one? I do love that scene. Um, I'm trying to think of ones that we've watched that I really like. I mean, obviously there's Clueless. We haven't done that oh, one yet. I love just Clueless. Because yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that one, I mean, it's not a full mall movie, you know, but it yeah. has a good mall scene or two. Yeah. There's a through line um, of it with the shopping yes. and the consumerism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I have a necessarily a favorite. I just always love when it, when it comes up, you know? Yeah. It's a, it's comforting to, when I, when you see it and, uh, it's all relatable. Uh, I yeah. grew up in Canada and we had malls, but there was always like an extra element of like Americanness in the movies yeah. that were like, oh, we don't have that store. It's like ours a little bit different or like, right. They were just, have, so you, have you ever seen Christmas in Wonderland? No. Uh, so that's it. That's shot at West Edmonton mall. Yeah. Oh yeah. We all know about West Edmonton. Yeah, we watched that. I mean, it's not an, an incredible film or anything, but yeah. it was it was like the reverse for me watching it. I was like, oh, that's fun. Those are stores I'm not really familiar with because it's Canadian. Yeah, it's like it's weird that our cultures. I mean, you probably didn't know it was Canadian until this moment, but um, I did because I listened to an episode of your podcast. To OK, prepare no, for the look podcast. at this. Both doing the research. <laughs> um, but our cultures are so similar and and there's just like this little bit of difference. It's mm -hmm. just like this 5%, I guess in the same way that like Californians are different than like other state. It's like a different state of America, let's be honest. Well, and also it's like, it's sort of interesting where it's like, you know, when you look at, cause we've also had Canadian people come on the podcast and, and, and suggest a store and it, we always end up doing the thing where it's like, if it's a Canadian specific store, it's like, well, it's kind of like the equivalent, the Canadian equivalent of blank, you yeah, know, it always yeah. becomes that kind of a conversation. And it is, it is honestly like we have similar stores that just are called different you know, target or Zellers or whatever, you know, right. it's just a little, a little bit different. <laughs> I wonder what like the corporate thinking is. It's like, can we still call it like Zellers or what was, what, or can we still call it Kmart in Canada? No, you can't. Why yeah, not? People the, won't just, get it. Canadians <laughs> won't get it. Call it Zellers. <laughs> Zellers. Okay. Yeah. Uh huh. Subtle differences. I was yeah. trying to think of any of the other Canadian stores we've talked about. Um, not Roots. coming to mind immediately. I think Roots oh. came down here though. Yeah. Roots is here. It's come up before they, in Christmas in Wonderland, they, uh, Every mall movie, almost all mall movies, have the moment where someone is being chased and they go into a window display and pretend to be a mannequin. And in Christmas in Wonderland, it's a Roots. Nice. Uh, so <laughs> I'm familiar with that one. <laughs> yeah. And now I, this isn't a mall thing, but Canada Goose is like a big thing for coats. They're like okay. these $800 parkas or something. So I, I think there's there's an there I remember reading that I think they have a pop up at the Grove right yeah, now. Yeah, that's where I saw it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. It I is stay, weird. I stay on on, on the mall news. <laughs> it's weird. Like the weirdest thing is like being in America and seeing Canadian culture infiltrate. You're just like, huh, that's interesting. It's <laughs> it's like we all come down here for America and then it kind of like fall like Drake. It just follows us in. You're like, what do you? <laughs> this is. You're throwing me off. <laughs> yeah. There's two kinds of Canadians you meet in America. The other ones are like, we're Canadian and we bond over it. And the other ones are like, I came here to not be with other Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Hurtful. I know. It's like, I'm more of the oh, first okay. one. I think that's probably a better way to be. <laughs> yeah. Well, this has been great. I really enjoyed talking with you some more. Um, where can people find you? Tell, plug your pod, your socials. Let's build your audience up to as many followers get that uh, cartoon off the ground and on to Cartoon Network. 
Yeah, man. Um, if it still well, exists. <laughs> yeah, it does. It yeah. sure does. Uh, well, thank you for having me. And uh, I guess I'll say, okay, definitely follow me on Instagram. Just at Paige Weldon. It's just my name. Um, I also have been trying to do TikToks. So you can follow me on TikTok at Paige Weldon Cartoons. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, but it's a sinking ship, I feel like. So up to you. And I have podcasts out every week. It's called Mall Talk. You just search mall talk and you'll find it. We talk about uh, we talk about people's hometown malls growing up. We talk about a mall store every week. It's a good time. And also I do have an, a stand-up album, Girlfriend at the Time. You can find that on all the things. Uh, if you buy it, that's cool. I get a little bit of money. And what else do I do with my life? I think that's about it for now <laughs> all great stuff and i'll say if you listen to the mall podcast like i did go back and listen to the pre-pandemic ones too because it's a yeah. nice taste of the old way of life <laughs> yeah. they're in person they're talking about life and it's all the churros and pretzels and all that stuff so yeah man <laughs> well thanks well thanks again and uh we'll talk soon okay cool. bye